last time we saw the definition of a probability space. So we saw that the probability space has three different parts. So I have a sample space, which I show with S or sometimes with Omega. I have a set of events. I'm going to show this with F because I want to use E for a single event. So F is the set of events, okay? And I have a probability function P that assigns a probability to every event. And we've seen uh, the axioms, we've seen what uh, properties should be satisfied. So suppose that this is a probability space We defined this concept of conditional probability. And the idea was this. I said that suppose I have some elements here, E subset of F. Oops, not subsets in F. So I want one event in F. And suppose that this is an event that has non-zero probability. Be an event such that the probability of E is not zero. So we use this to define conditional probabilities. We said that for every E prime that is also an event, the probability of E prime conditioned on E is going to be defined as the probability of their intersection. And by the way, when I don't write anything, when I just write E E prime, that means intersection of E and E prime, okay? Divided by the probability of E. So this is how we define the probability function. And in the last session, I also told you that this is actually just a different probability function. So I'm going to write it like this, but if you think of it as a new function, let's call it P sub E, that basically, takes every event and maps it to a number between zero and one, and basically takes the event E prime, maps it to the probability of E E prime divided by probability of E. You can actually check that this function, it's a valid probability function. So it satisfies all the conditions that we required uh, of a probability. So basically what I'm doing here is defining a new probability function, but I don't really want to think about it like that. I just want to think about it intuitively. And I want to think that basically what this is saying is, suppose I know that E has happened, what is the probability given this information that E prime has also happened? Okay. Or of course I can change the tense to future tense. Suppose that I know E will happen, what is the probability that E prime will happen? Or another way of looking at this, which is again, very intuitive is this. Suppose that I have my entire set S. So let's say this is my entire set S and it had a probability of one, right? But now I have some assumption E. I know that E has happened. So I have this part. Doesn't work for some reason. Let's say I know that this has happened. Okay. So if I want to ask for the probability of something else, if I want to ask for the probability of some E prime, First of all, given that I know E has happened, the parts of E prime that are outside of E don't matter at all, right? So this part doesn't matter. What matters is this part, right? So that's why I'm looking at the probability of the intersection of E and E prime. But then I have to also kind of resize my probabilities, right? Because I know that E has happened. So from my point of view, the probability of E should now be one. So I'm taking E and I'm resizing all my probabilities so that the probability of E becomes one. And that's basically the same as saying divide by the probability of E. So that's the intuition that we have here. When I say probability of E prime conditioned on E or given E, that's why I have this formula for it. 
but officially again this is just the definition like i'm defining it like this okay now based on this i'm going to say that two events are independent if knowing about one of them doesn't give me any information about the other one right but again how am i going to define this so we say let's call them a and b a and b are independent events if basically i want to say consider the probability of a given b this should be the same as the probability of a okay so I had some probability in mind for A happening, and then someone came and told me that B has happened. This is not going to change the probability that I have in mind for A. That's the definition of independence. Now, of course, if you just expand this, probability of A given B is the probability of AB divided by the probability of B. And if I'm saying that this is equal to the probability of A, basically what this means is that probability of A, B, which is A intersection B, is probability of A times probability of B. So I can also use this one as definition of independence. So two events are independent if the probability of their intersection is just the product of their probabilities. Okay. Now, some simple examples of independent events. Imagine that I'm flipping a coin twice, and let's say that the second time has no dependence on the first time, right? How does that match our definition of independence here? So basically my set S, my sample space, is going to be all the results that I can get by flipping a coin twice. So I can get two heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails, right? And each one of these outcomes are equally likely. So the probability of each outcome is exactly one fourth, let's say, okay? So now, if I ask you something like this, what is the probability that the first coin toss gives me heads, assuming that the second coin toss gave me tails. Okay. So these two are independent. I don't care what happened to the second coin toss. The probability of my first coin toss giving me heads was a half. So this is also a half. But again, this was just intuitive. Can we actually check this? So if I call this one, this event A, and if I call this event B, Okay, what does this formally mean? So what is A? A is all the outcomes, all the elements of S such that the first one, the first coin is H. So it's H, H, and H, T, right? What is B? B is, well, I have to have T in the second one. So H, T, 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 okay. So what is the probability of A? The probability of A is two fourths, which is just a half. Actually, I can compute the probability of B also. That's also a half. Now, what is the probability of A given B? So I know that I am in B. And I want to see what is the probability that I'm also in A. So this is the probability that I'm in both A and B divided by the probability of B, which was a half. Okay, but only HT is in both A and B. And so this is going to be the probability of HT over a half. But uh, every outcome had the same probability one fourth. So this is one fourth over a half, which is half, okay? So formally, this is the reason why these two are independent because 
I look at the probability of A and I look at the probability of A conditioned on B and both of them are the same. Now, of course, you can also prove that if A is independent of B, B is independent of A, that's not hard. Just play with these formulas. But now let me give you kind of a counterintuitive example. So here's the example. Suppose that again, I'm flipping two coins. Let's say this is a game and I win the game if at least one coin comes up heads. Okay. So here's my question. What is the probability that I have two heads conditioned upon knowing that I have won the game. Okay, again, two fair coins. I plus two fair coins. I'm saying if at least one of them is heads, I win. What is the probability? So Assuming that I won the game, what is the probability that both of them were heads? Okay. Yes. Now, you didn't have the wrong intuition. A wrong intuition would be to say, well, one of the coins has to be heads. The other coin has the same probability of being heads or tails. So this should be a half. But no, that's not how that works. So again, let's write it like this. Let's say this is my set A. This is my event B. So A has only one outcome in it, H, H. What are the outcomes in B? Yeah, everything other than T, T. So H, T, T, H, H, H. Okay. So this is going to be the probability of A intersection with B. In this case, A is actually a subset of B, so it's just the probability of A over probability of B. And this one is going to be one fourth, but then the probability of B is clearly three fourths. So this is a third. Okay. So what went wrong in that intuitive definition or uh, intuitive argument that I had before, which said that, well, one of the two sides if I won the game, it means that at least one of the two coins was heads, and then the other coin is tails with probability half. Well, the problem is that I'm not saying which coin, right? I'm saying one of the coins is heads, and then I'm talking about the other coin, right? But what if both of them are heads? Which one is the other coin then? Or another way of looking at this is that basically we're saying if we have one head, the probability that the other coin is tails is a half. But let's just look here. If I have one head, the probability that the other one is also heads is a third, because in this case I have tails and in this case I also have tails. Okay. Great. So this is how we talk about independence. Now, suppose that I want to extend my definition of independence to more than two events. So let's say I have three events. When can I say that three events are independent? So let me do it like this. Let A, B, and C, all of them in F, be three events. We say they are independent. If, well, give me a definition. When would you say they're independent? Yeah, so of course I want every two of them to be independent, right? So I want to say that the probability of A, B is just probability of A, probability of B, and the same thing for B, C. 
and the same thing for AC. But I need something more. I also need this one. I need to say that the probability of the intersection of all three is just the product of all the probabilities. Okay. And you can now see how I would extend this to four or more, right? Basically, I have to take any subset of my events and I have to say the probability of the intersection of this subset is just the product of the probabilities. Now, of course, our probabilities also satisfy things like the rules of addition and multiplication, and you can also do inclusion exclusion with them. These are all easy things, so I'm going to just skip most of them. Uh, you're going to read the book anyway. Oh, is that just a Yes, this is the definition we give for independence of three events. And generally, the definition for independence of k events would be that the probability of the intersection of any subset of them is the multiplication of their events. Okay. Uh, so let me give you another problem, which is quite interesting. So this is an example from the book. It says that an insurance company believes that people can be divided into two classes, those who are accident prone and those who are not. Their statistics show that an accident prone person will have an accident at some time within a fixed one year period with probability 0.4, whereas this probability is 0.2 for a non-accident prone person. Okay, so this is what we have, the probability of an accident, or actually, instead of writing it like that, let me just write it in English so that you have to translate it. So uh -huh. uh, let's say for an accident prone person, there is 0 0.4 probability of accident within the year. Okay. And then for a normal person, so non-accident prone person, the probability is 0.2. Okay. Now, here's the thing. It says that if we assume that 30% of the population is accident prone, what is the probability that a new customer will have an accident within a year of buying insurance? So 0.3, or 30% of the population are accident prone. And the question is, what is the probability that a particular customer, and we're assuming this customer is chosen randomly, of course, and uniformly, the probability that the customer has an accident within one year. Give me the answer. Give me the reason. Okay. Look, uh, here's what we can do. I can define different events. So I can define an event called A, which is basically the event that the customer has an accident, right? I can also de define another event. Uh, let's call this B. And this is basically saying that the customer is accident prone. Okay. And of course, B complement would be that they are not accident prone.
Now, suppose that I want to find the probability of A. What is the probability of A? I can basically divide A in two parts. The part that has an intersection with B and the part that has an intersection with B complement. So I can say probability of A is the probability of A intersect with B plus the probability of A intersect with B complement. This is just breaking down a set to two separate parts. Okay. But what can I say about the probability of A intersects B? Yes, based on what I had here, based on this definition, probability of A intersect B is just the probability of A given B times probability of B. Okay. So probability of A given B, Actually, I prefer to write probability of B first. Probability of B times probability of A given B. Plus probability of B complement times probability of A given B complement. Okay. Now, this is called base rule. But actually, honestly, I don't know why it has a name. It's such a trivial thing. Anyway, what I'm doing here is that I'm saying I want to find the probability of an event A and I have another event B. I'm going to do a case work. Either B happens or it doesn't happen, right? So case one, if B happens, then it happens with probability of B. And then what is the probability that A also happens? It's probability of A given B. Case two, if B doesn't happen, the probability of that is probability of B complement. And then what is the probability that A happens? Probability of A given B complement. So it's a very intuitive thing. But you can also just write it like that and use the definition of conditional probability to prove it. Okay. So now for this particular case, and by the way, you could also solve this without base rule, but it just makes things nicer here. I want the probability of A, which is the probability of having an accident, right? So this is going to be probability of B, the probability of being accident prone, which is 30%, times the probability of having an accident if you are accident prone, which is 0.4. Plus the probability of B complement. Well, probability of B was 30%, so probability of B complement is just 70%, times the probability that you have an accident if you are not accident prone which is point okay. and this is point two six. Okay. Yes. So now I can extend this base rule to more than one case as well. But again, what you have to understand here is the intuition. The intuition is that I'm doing casework and whenever I do casework, I can do things like this. I can say, my first case is happening with this probability and my second case is happening with this probability. And if the first case happens, then what is the probability that the thing I was looking for actually happens? And so on. So uh, yeah, instead of two cases, you can have as many cases as you want. Okay. Great. Let's go to our favorite problem, the Monty Hall problem. So remember the idea was that we have three doors and so this is door one, door two, door three and behind one of them is a price. Okay. And then the way the game went was that you would randomly choose one of the doors so let's say you chose door one, and then the game show host would open another door that didn't have the price. For example, show you that door two does not have the price. And then they would ask you, do you want to switch or do you want to keep the parameters? Do you want to keep the parameters? 
Okay. So we want to know what is the probability of winning if you switch and what is the probability of winning if you don't switch. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to say that my outcomes are just one, two, or three, which means that well, which door has the price, right? And, okay, let's do the first simple thing. Suppose that uh, the probability of each one of these is the same. So the probability of one is the same as the probability of two. By the way, I sometimes don't put the set notation, but this is the set containing only one, okay? Equals probability of three and all of them are a third. Now we saw this towards the end of the last session that if instead of playing this game, I just come to you and I tell you, hey, the price is not in door two then the probability that the price is in door one is the same as the probability that it's in door three and it's one half instead of a third, right? So let's do this. Let's say, what is the probability that the price is in one, assuming that the price is not in two? Okay. So if I write this as sets, this is the probability of the set that only contains one conditioned on, well, one or three, okay? So by definition, this is just going to be the probability of their intersection, which is just one over the probability of one and three. And this is a third over two thirds so it's just a half, okay. But this is not really the problem that we're considering here. The problem we're considering is that I have first chosen one of the doors, and then after I've chosen one of the doors, the, the host has opened a different door that didn't have the price in it, right? And now I'm asking, what is the probability that the door that I chose originally has the price. Okay. So one way of looking at this is to use independence. Suppose that my strategy is that I'm not going to change the door. Then whatever the host does is independent of my strategy. I'm not going to change the door. My strategy doesn't depend on what the, ho what the host does. The host's strategy doesn't depend on what I do. So, the probability of me winning is going to be independent of what the host does, so it's going to be a third if I don't change. Okay, that's one way of arguing about this. But suppose that I want to exactly write the conditional probabilities, and suppose that I don't want to argue using independence. And let's just analyze one of the cases, but all the other cases are just mirror images of this, so the same thing happens. So suppose. I have chosen door one. And the host opened door two. Okay. Now. The question is, what is the probability the price is in door one? Okay. So let's look at it from the point of view of the host. Okay. So, and let's just draw the probabilities here. So let's say uh, starting at the base state, there was a third probability that door one has the price. There was a third probability that door two has the price. And there was a third probability that door three has the price. Okay. Now, 
I have chosen door one and I don't know which of these spaces I was in, but the host knows, right? So let's see what happens. Let's say that the prize was in door one and I chose door one, right? So what are the options for the host? Which doors can the host open? Two or three. Right. But if the price was in door two and I chose door one, then the host can only open door three. Right. If the price was in door three and I chose door one, then the host can only open door two. So as you see, in one of these cases, the, co the host has two different choices. In the other ones, the host has only one choice. So in this case, we don't have independence. In this case, what the host does is not independent of what I have chosen. And then in the next stage, when I want to choose whether to keep the same door or switch, that's also not independent of what the host has done. So this is very different from this problem that we were considering at the beginning. Okay. Great. So how would you model this? What is the extra knowledge that you have? So I cannot write it as a conditional probability like this. I cannot say that what is the probability that price is in one given that price is not in two. How can I write it? Again, I just want you to figure out how to write this as a conditional probability. Maybe you can change your uh, initial sample space. Maybe that helps you. So instead of just working with a sample space that has the winning door, let's have a sample space that has two things in it. So every sample tells me what's the winning door and what's the thing that I have chosen originally, okay? So let's work with a different sample space and let's see if this works. Let's work with the sample space I'm going to have a new S, and this is going to have nine elements. Okay, so it's going to be one, 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 two, one, three, and then two, one, two, 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 three, and three, one, three, two, And the idea is that the first coordinate of every sample is where the prize is. And the second coordinate is what I chose at first. Okay. Now, these two coordinates are independent of each other. Right? Because we said that the price is put in one of the doors and that door is chosen uniformly at random. And I'm also choosing one of the doors and that's uniform as well. Actually, I don't really need the independence here even without the independence, the argument goes through, but they are independent. So each one of these outcomes has the same probability one night. Okay. Great. So what do I want? I want to say, again, suppose that I have chosen door one and the host opened door two. What is the probability that the price is in door one? So what is the probability that the price is in door one? So I have one something, right? Given that two things have happened. I have chosen door one and the host has opened door two. Okay. Given that I have chosen door one, so 
something one. But how do I write that the host has open door two? So you see, at this point, we don't really have a probabilistic way of looking at it. Because if you go back to this, this is called the decision tree. If you go back to this decision tree, what's happening here is that the host is making a decision. But I'm not really saying that the host makes this decision with any particular probability, right? So in this case, the host is definitely going to open two. In this case, the host is definitely going to open three. But in this case, I don't know. Right. So I can either change the problem. I can say, well, in this case, the host opens one of the two doors uniformly at random. I can say there are two or three. Or I can just say, well, some of the cases are going to be impossible. Okay. In any case, I have to still extend my sample space. So my sample space so far has two components, what is the price and what is my first choice? Let's now have three components. Where is the price? What's my first choice? And what was the thing that, and what was the door that the host opened? Okay, so let me do it like this. Let's say my sample space now has three parts, let's call them X, Y, Z, where all of them are between one and three, okay? And the idea is that X is again where the price is, Y is my initial choice, and Z is just going to be the open door. Now, how many elements do I have in my sample space? 27, right. But are all of them equally likely? Because even though X and Y are independent of each other, Z is not independent of X and Y. Okay. So what's happening here is that, well, Z can never be X, right? Because uh, the host is never going to open the door that has the price. But Z is also never going to be the, the same as Y because if he, if he opens the door I chose, that's just the end of the game, right? Okay. So I have this, but my sample space has a bunch of points that have probability zero, and I can remove those from the sample space. So I can say my sample space contains the points such that Z is not equal to X and Z is not equal to Y. Okay. Well, this reduces the number of points in my sample space, but now I still have another problem. And the problem is that not all the points in my sample space have the same probability anymore, right? So the reason I'm doing this exercise is I wanna show you how hard it is sometimes to just figure out what exactly your sample space is. Okay. So let's write down what we have here and let's see what probabilities we can assign to them. And in order to be able to assign probabilities, I'm going to say, if we are in this case, if basically the uh, host has two choices as to which door to reveal, let's say that he just chooses one of them uniformly, okay? So what is my sample space now? My sample space is going to contain these points. So maybe the price was in one and I chose one, and he opened two, okay? Or maybe the price was in one and I chose one and he opened three, okay? I, I have to write the other cases, but let's just look at these two cases. What are the probabilities? So 
the probability that the price is in one is a third. And then the probability that I make my initial choice to be one, given that the price was in one, is also a third, right? Because these two are independent. What is the probability that the post opens door two, given that I have chosen one and the price is in one? It's a half, right? So the probability of this whole thing is one eighteenth. And the probability of this one is also one eighteenth. Okay. Great. So this is one one two one one three. We have to write a lot more. So let's say uh, it was in one, and I chose two. Then the host has only one choice to open three. Okay. But this element has a probability of one ninth. Because again, the probability that the price is in door one is one third. The probability that I choose door two is also one third and it's independent of where the price is. So the probability of the first two coordinates combined is one minus. But then for the third coordinate, there was no choice. It was with probability one. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what what is the probability that uh, it's in one, let's say, I choose three and he opens two. This is also one nice. Okay, now I can write the other probabilities very similarly. Let me just go to the next page. So let's say the price was in two. I said one, so the host is forced to open three. This is also happening with probability one ninth. Let's say it was in two, I said two. So the host now has an option to open either one or three. So one will be opened with probability one eighteenth. And then two, two, three, this will also happen with probability one eighteenth. Now let's say the price was in two, I said three, the host is forced to open one. So this is going to happen with probability one nine. Okay. Now I can do this for the case where the price is in door three as well. So if it's three and I said one, the host is forced to open two. This is probability one nine. If it's in three and I say two, the host is forced to open one. This is probability one nine. If it's in three and I also say three, the host has a choice. And each of them happens with probability one eighteenth. Okay. So this is now my probability function. I'm just showing what probability is assigned to every outcome. Of course, if you have a set of outcomes as your event, it's just the sum of the probabilities. Okay. But now can I come back and answer this question? So suppose I have chosen door one and the host open door two. What is the probability the price is in door one? Okay, so let's take all of this. I have chosen door one and the host open door two. And let's give all of this a name. Let's call this B. Okay, and let's say the price is in door A. I'm going to call this A. I want the probability of A given B. Okay, so probability of A given B is just the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of B. Okay, first of all, what is the intersection? I have chosen door one, the host has opened door two, price is in door one, right? So it's one, one, two. It's only this one, the intersection. So the probability of the intersection is 1 18th. Okay. What was B? B is that I have chosen door one, the host has opened door two. So I can have anything as my first component, but Y is one and Z is two. Okay. So I have this one, 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 two, actually. 
write it here. So I have one, one, two. Uh, again, as, as long as I have one, two at the end, I have to take it. So I don't have anything here. I have three, one, two. Is that the only ones? Yes. Okay. So it's one eighteenth over. What was the probability of one one two? One eighteenth. What was the probability of three one two? It was one ninth. So this is a third. So basically, we prove that if I don't switch, if I keep the same door, my probability of winning is a third. Okay. And the reason people didn't find this intuitive is because if you look at these two outcomes, so one, one, two, and three, one, two, people just assume that these two have the same probability of happening. Right? But that's not necessarily the case. So whenever you have two possibilities, it doesn't mean that it's 50-50. Right? Okay. Great. But now I could also do the opposite of this, and I could also do it for any combination of doors, you would get the same result. And the interesting thing is that it's also not really dependent on the probabilities here, as long as the probability is not with probability one choosing one and with probability zero choosing the other. Okay. Great. But again, I could make the same argument based on independence. And if I make the argument based on independence, things are much easier. It's just that I'm saying, hey, if my strategy is that I'm choosing a door and I'm never changing my choice, it doesn't matter what the host is doing. So whatever I do is independent of whatever the host is doing. So the probability of A given B is just going to be the probability of A for me, assuming that I don't change my mind, right? Which is a third. Okay. Great. But now let's go to that other favorite problem that we had about cancer. Okay. So we had this. We had that. We said that we have a cancer test. that is 90% accurate, such that if you have cancer, it says yes, it says positive, with 90% probability. If you do not have cancer, it says no with 90% probability. And the question was, suppose that you have taken this test and suppose that it has come out positive. What is the probability that you have cancer? What is the probability that I have cancer if my test is positive? And when we were doing the simulations last time, we saw that this is actually very much dependent on what percentage of the population actually has cancer. So it's dependent on what is the probability of having cancer if we don't consider the test at all. And let's just give that a name. So suppose that the probability of having cancer is P. P is the probability of having cancer. Okay. Let's just visualize this. So let's say this is my entire sample space of all the people. So every person is a sample for me. And some of the people have cancer. Right. So let's say Let's say this is the set that have cancer. I'm going to call it C. 
Okay. Now, some people are going to get a positive test result. Some people are going to get a negative test result. And well, we're assuming that our test is either positive or negative. Okay, so no other outcomes. Uh, so I can divide my entire set into two parts, the positive part and the negative part. Okay. So I show this one with T plus, the test has come out positive. And I showed this part with T minus. The test is negative. Okay. What do I want? I'm asking what is the probability that I have cancer given that my test was positive? Okay. Great. How do I find this? This is just the probability of uh, having cancer intersection with T plus divided by the probability of T plus. Okay. How do I find these two probabilities? So you see, I have to find two things. I have to find what is the probability that my test is positive? And I have to find what is the probability that I have cancer when my test is positive. Okay. So let's see. I want to somehow rewrite this so that I can get it based on the probabilities that I have here. So one of the things that I know is that if I have cancer, the probability of getting a plus result is 90%. Right. So what is that? What is this 90% probability? This is the probability of T plus given cancer. Right. And what is this other one? This is the probability of T minus given no cancer. This is cancer complement, sorry. Okay. Okay. So the problem is that I want the probability of cancer given T plus C given T plus, but I have T plus given C, but that's fine. I can just try to write this one, the numerator in a different way. So what is the probability of C intersection with T plus based on what I already know? So this is just going to be the probability of T plus given C times the probability of C, right? Just using the definition. But what can I write for the probability of T plus in the denominator? That's a problem, right? I don't have the probability of T plus. But I can use Bayes' rule here. I can say I want the probability of T plus, I want the probability that my test is positive, so there are two cases, either I have cancer or I don't have cancer, right? So the probability that my test is positive is the probability that I have cancer times the probability that my test is positive if I have cancer, plus the probability that I don't have cancer times the probability that my test is positive if I don't have cancer. Let's write all of these things down. So what is the probability that my test is positive if I have cancer? This is 0.9. What is the probability that I have cancer? I said I just call that small p. Okay, times small p. Okay, what is the probability that I have cancer? Small p. Probability that the test is positive if I have cancer? 0.9 plus. What is the probability that I don't have cancer? Well, that's one minus B. What is the probability that the test is positive if I don't have cancer? Well, if I don't have cancer, the test is negative with probability 90%, so it's positive with probability 10%. Times 0.1. Okay. So this is the probability that I have cancer if my test is positive. So it's going to be 0 0.9 P over 
zero point nine p plus zero point one one minus p. Okay. And of course, if you give different values of p, you will get different results here, which means that uh, actually the probability that you have cancer is dependent on what percentage of the population have cancer, given this information. But there's also a nice intuitive way of looking at this. Look, what are the people who are going to get a positive test result? In what cases will you get a positive test result? So imagine that I have millions of people. Well, some of them have cancer and the ones who have cancer are going to get a positive test result with 90% probability, okay? So if P people have cancer, 0 0.9 times P are going to get a positive result. But then, there are also one minus p people, again proportions, who don't have cancer, and 10% of them are also going to get a positive result. So what I'm what I know is that I'm in this set who has got the positive result. Right? The question is what is the probability that I was in the first part of this set, the parts that got the positive result because they had cancer? Okay. And then this formula suddenly makes sense because this is just the proportion of the people who got cancer and tested positive. And this is just the proportion of people who tested positive. And they could have tested positive because they had cancer or maybe they didn't have cancer, but then with some error, they still tested positive, okay? So all we're doing here is writing the definition over and over again in many different ways. It's nothing special. It's actually quite intuitive. Okay. Great. Now we're going to go forward and we're going to define something else. I want to define the concept of a random variable. Now, in the most general case, a random variable is just a variable, it's a function that maps every outcome to an element of a different set. And I want this second set to also be measurable. Okay. But in this course, we're really working with real random variables. So a real random variable is a function, let me call it big X, that maps elements of my sample space to real numbers. Now, I want to have another condition on this, and the condition is that, well, look, I'm, again, forget that we're in a probability space. These are both, uh, spaces that have measures, right? So let's say that I'm mapping from a measure space to another measure space. What do I want? I want to be able to talk about things like, what is the probability that this function happens to be in this particular set? So for example, for real variables, I want to say, uh, what is the probability that the result of my function is in a particular segment? So I want these probabilities to exist. I want to say, if I have a segment, I should be able to talk about the probability that my function result is in this segment. Or in general, if instead of R, I had something else here, I want to say that if I have a measurable set, then its pre-image should also be measured. Okay. So a real random variable is a function X from S to R, such that for every uh, segments, and also I don't need to look at all of my segments. I can only look at the segments that are of the form minus infinity to some, right? Because if I have it for these, I have it for everyone. So such that for every segment, this, let's call it, I don't know. Let's call it alpha. Whenever I don't know what to call something, I just call it alpha such that for every segment alpha, 
x inverse of alpha is an event. Okay. Or another way of talking about this is that the probability that x is less than or equal to alpha exists. Okay. So I want or okay. The way what I'm writing here is this. So when I say the probability that X is less than or equal to alpha, what I mean is the probability of the subset of my sample space such that X of S is less than or equal to alpha. And when I say I want this to exist, all I mean is that this set should have a probability associated to it. So this set should be an event. Okay, this set is. Great. Now, we mostly talk about discrete random variables and discrete random variables are random variables that take either a finite number of different values or a countable number of different values. Okay. So we say x is a discrete random variable if range of x is either finite or countable. Okay, so for example, suppose that I'm passing two dice and I'm talking about the sum of the two results, right? So if I toss two uh, dice, my set S is going to have two components. Every sample is going to have two components, X and Y, such that each of them is between one and six, right? So I have 36 elements. Now I can just have a function. I'm going to call this, uh, it's sound, so I'm going to call it sigma, which takes S and maps it to real values. And what it does is whenever the result was X, Y, I'm going to map it to X plus Y. So it's just going to give me the sum of the numbers on two dice. Okay. Now, if I have a function like this, I can talk about probabilities like this. I can say, what is the probability that the result of this function is seven, for example? Okay, but what's interesting to me uh, for random variables is that I can talk about this concept of the expected value of a random variable. And the expected value of a random variable is intuitively the average value that I expect to see if I do my experiment many times and every time I just compute the value of this random value. Okay, but I'm going to give a better definition. So here's how I'm going to define it. I'm going to say, suppose X is a discrete random variable. And so suppose X is discrete. And let's say the values it can take are X1, X2, so on. So, range of x is x1, x2. It might be finite or infinite, but if it's infinite, it's count. Okay. Now I want to define the expected value of x. So we define, and I write it like this. I write e of x. This is the expected value of x. I define it like this. I say, just take the sum over all the values that X can take, right? So, uh, and then take XI times the probability that X equals XI. This is I from one to either infinity or N, depending on whether the range is finite or infinite. Okay. So again, I have this discrete random variable, but I'm really interested in is on average, what would be the value of this discrete random variable? And what I can do is I can go over every possible value that it can take 
and I can ask what is the probability that it takes this value, and then I'm taking the average, but the average is just uh, weighted by these probabilities. Okay, so again, a very intuitive thing. Great. Now, one of the nice properties of expected value, and something that will definitely be in, in the exam or the homework, is this. If I have two random variables, so let x and y be two random variables, and let's say I have also some number a. What is the expected value of a times x plus y? This is just a times expected value of x plus expected value of y. Okay. So this is what we call linearity of expectation. And you can get it by just looking at the definition. Just write the definition, expand it, they're the same. Okay. So this looks like a very trivial thing. If I have two random variables, I mean, if I have one random variable x, the expected value of ax should be a times the expected value of x. Just put the values here, right? Uh, and of course, for the sum as well. But we'll see that we can solve some surprisingly interesting problems. So one of the problems that you have already seen is this problem. Suppose that we look at all the uh, different n factorial permutations of the numbers from 1 to n, and we ask how many inversions are there. Uh, there was this problem, I think, was it in the exam or was it in one of the homeworks? So let p be a permutation of the numbers from 1 to n. An inversion is basically some i less than j such that pi is bigger than pj. Okay. So if I have two numbers and the smaller number appears second appears after the bigger number in my permutation, I say that's an inversion. And then I think the question in the homework was that, suppose I take all of my permutations, what is the uh, total number of inversions in all of them? Okay. But now I'm going to ask something else. I'm going to say, what is the expected number of of inversions? So I'm going to say, suppose that I choose a permutation uniformly at random. So I choose each of my n factorial permutations with the same probability one over n factorial. And then I have a function, basically my random variable, and my random variable x just counts the number of inversions in this permutation. And I'm asking what is the expected value of x? Okay. So suppose we choose p uniformly at random. What is, and let's say x is the number of inversions in this randomly chosen permutation p. What is the expected value of x? Okay. Now, one way of solving this would be to just solve the counting problem. Because all of my permutations are equally likely, the expected value of x is just the sum of the number of inversions in all the permutations divided by n factorial. Right, because again, this is this goes back to the intuition that the expected value is just a weighted average, but in this case, all of my permutations have the same weight, the same probability. Okay, but let's see if we can solve this using linearity of expectation. So I want to somehow write x 
as a linear combination of a bunch of other random variables. And I want these other random variables to be easier to compute somehow. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I define a new random variable xij, and this is what we call an indicator random variable. So an indicator random variable is a random variable that is either one or zero. Okay, so I'm going to say xij is one if the pair ij is an inversion and xij is zero otherwise, if it's not an inversion. Okay, and again, remember this xij is a random variable. So it's a function that is mapping from our sample space to, in this case, either zero or one. Okay, so basically what happens here is that xij of p tells me whether ij is an inversion in the permutation P. Okay. First of all, do you agree that X is just the sum of all XIJs? Right. Of course, I want the sum over I's that are less than J. Because X is the total number of inversions so I can just go over every pair of IJ, ask are you an inversion? And if they are, I will just add. Okay. So if I want the expected value of X based on the linearity of expectation, this is just the sum of overall I that is less than J of the expected value of X I J. Okay. So now my problem is easier. I don't have to find the expected value of X. I just have to find the expected value of X I J. But let's do that. What is the expected value of xij? Now, this is the part where you see why it's great to have indicator variables. So what was the definition of expected value? I have to go over every possible value, and I have to say what is the probability that I have this value, and then times it with the value itself, right? So in this case, it's going to be 1 times the probability that xij is one, plus zero times the probability that xij is zero, right? But I don't care about the zero part, right? So whenever I have an indicator variable, its expected value is just its probability of being one. which is hopefully easier to compute. Okay, so now all of this has come down to this simple question. What is the probability that xij is one? What is the probability, if I choose a particular i and a particular j, that they are not in the correct order? Well, that probability is exactly a half, right? Why? Because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the permutations that have ij in the correct order and permutations that have ij in the wrong order. And the one-to-one -one correspondence is just a function that swaps i and j, right? So if they're in the correct order, you swap them, they're in the wrong order. If they're in the wrong order, you swap them, they're in the correct order. So the number of permutations that have them in the right order is the same as the number of permutations that have them in the correct order. This is just a half. Okay. So now I go back. The expected value of x is going to be the sum over all i's that are less than j of the expected value of xij, which was just a half. So how many pairs of ij do I have where i is less than j? And choose two. Yes. That's my answer. And now I have a better way of solving that original counting problem as well. I just take this, multiply it by n factorial. It gives me the answer to my original counting. Okay. The last puzzle from the previous session was this sleeping beauty thing. So remember the idea was that on Monday I give you poison 
and you go to sleep mm -hmm. and then I flip a coin. If the coin is heads, I wake you up on Tuesday. If the coin is tails, I wake you up on Tuesday. I again give you poison. It removes all of your memory and I wake you up on Wednesday. And every time I ask you to predict if the coin was heads or tails. Now, the problem with this question was that it kind of confused the concepts of probability and expected value, right? So if I ask you, what is the probability that the coin came up heads or tails? It's always a half. Because at this point, I have a sample space, which is heads and tails. And I have a probability function, which is assigning uniform probability to both. Okay, but if, on the other hand, the question is predict whether it was heads or tails. And based on your prediction, I'm going to give you a reward. I'll give you $1 every time you uh, predict correctly. Then it's in your best interest to say tails. Thanks. So here's the thing. What is the expected number of uh, wins that you will get if you say heads. Okay, so this is what I'm saying. Suppose that you decide to say heads. So every time I wake you up, I ask you, was the coin heads or tails? And you always say heads. And by the way, you can only have one decision because you don't have any memory. Right, every time I'm erasing your memory. So uh, if you always say head, what is the expected reward that you will get? Well, the expected reward would just be this. It would be, well, with probability half, we're going to go up and you're going to get a reward of one. With probability half, we're going to go down here and you're going to get a reward of zero, right? So your expected reward is just a half times one plus a half times zero, which is a half, okay? Now, suppose that you decide tails. What is your expected reward now? Well, with probability half, you're wrong and you're not going to get anything. So half times zero, but with probability half, you're right. <coughs> but I'm going to wake you up twice and you're going to win twice. So this is now half times two. So this is one. So in this puzzle, whenever you wake up, you'd better say things. So you will have a higher expected reward, but that has nothing to do with the probability. The probability is the same. 